Become a sustaining member of the Commonwealth Club for just $10 a month. Welcome to today's virtual Commonwealth Club program. I'm Rachel Myro, Senior Editor of KQED's Silicon Valley News Desk, and it's my great pleasure today to introduce Mehdi Hassan, author of Win Every Argument, The Art of Debating, Persuading, and Public Speaking. Mehdi is an award-winning journalist and host of The Mehdi Hassan Show on MSNBC and Peacock. Some of Mehdi's most notable interviews include guests like Edward Snowden, Judd Apatow, and Jon Stewart. Previously, Mehdi was a columnist and podcast host at The Intercept and political commentator and presenter at Al Jazeera English. Before we get started, if you have questions for Mehdi, please submit them in the YouTube chat and we'll get to them later in this program. Mehdi, welcome. Rachel, thanks so much for having me. A good ask the question. Since there's three of us in this conversation, what's the cat's name? Oh, well, we've got two cats here, actually. We've got <laughs> Owl and Bear on either side okay. of me. So Good they to might be popping here, up. <laughs> if they have any questions, I'll pass them on. <laughs> well, to start, you know, whether we're talking about blowhards at the family table or the dumpster fires on social media, a lot of people today would argue argument and debate are at the heart of so much polarization in our world. But you write in your introduction to the book, I consider argument and debate uh, to be the lifeblood of democracy, as well as the only surefire way to establish truth. So I'm going to ask you to defend your assertion. So I don't think you can have a functioning democracy or a functioning free press or a functioning public square unless people are willing to have good faith agreements and disagreements, unless they're willing to debate the issues at stake in our democracy. There literally is no democracy without a free press, without people arguing over the right way forward, without people making their case. Um, and there's an intrinsic value, in my view, to searching for the truth through argumentation, through debate, through discussion, through testing proposition, through examining and challenging ideas in our public square. And I quote the French essayist from the 19th century, Joseph Joubert, in the book, that it's better to debate an issue without settling it than to settle an issue without debating it. Know your audience. This is a familiar idea to so many people, even though so few of us put it into practice. How do you apply this maxim to win an argument? So sometimes we get carried away in a debate or discussion or argument with the idea of trying to convince the other person. And sometimes the other person is not going to be convinced. It may be because they're a politician on the other side who has no interest of dropping their party identity. It may be some uh, stubborn uncle at the Thanksgiving table. It may be a bad faith actor. It may be someone in the courtroom that you're across from. And you have to understand that they may not be the target of your persuasive project. You have to understand that the audience is your real target. They're the ones you're trying to convince and persuade if there is an audience, if you're in a courtroom and there's 12 jurors, if you're in a boardroom trying to make a deal and persuade people around the table, uh, if you're in high school debate and you're trying to win over the judges, wherever you happen to be, whether you're a politician on a presidential debate platform speaking to millions of people across the country, who is your audience? What do you know about the audience? What do they want? How do you tailor your arguments to that audience? For far too long, we've only come up with arguments and claims that sound good to us not to a room full of strangers. And what I'm saying in the book in the very first chapter is understand the importance of that room full of strangers. And there's a great line from the director, Billy Wilder, who says, you know, an individual person may be an imbecile, but a thousand imbeciles sitting together in the dark, that's critical genius. You can't ignore that. And I guess this is a concept that's going to be familiar to high school students who are in debate programs or mock trial to pre-law students. You always have to play to the gallery. 
Yeah, very much so. And politicians get this. Some of them do, not all of them. But I worry again, we, and I talk later in the book about confirmation bias. We live in a world where we are stuck. Uh, Rachel, you know this better than me, that on social media, whether it's your media diet in terms of what radio stations you listen to or what TV channels you watch or what newspapers you read or which company you keep in the real world, in IRL, we surround ourselves with people who agree with us. We watch media sources of things that we like. And the problem is we get um, you know, taken over by confirmation bias. So we think, wow, I've got all the arguments. This sounds good to me and my friends. I haven't seen any opposing arguments in my limited media diet or my limited travels. And therefore I'm ready. I'm ready to make the case. And then it comes time to make the case. And we think, oh, I didn't think of that. Oh, that point that someone made over there. I don't have a rebuttal to that. I haven't thought through the issue from all sides, let alone both sides or one side. So what I'm saying in the book is, interrogate the evidence, have an open mind. The book is as much about critical thinking as it is about critical speaking and critical listening. It's about opening your mind, considering more than one side to an argument, being prepared for anything that anyone might throw at you, whether you're in the courtroom or the boardroom or a job interview, as they say, at the Thanksgiving table, wherever you may be where an argument comes up and you need to win that argument, it's best to be fully prepared, see all sides and not be lost by confirmation bias. But going back to the audience and folks at present company accepted. Uh, but Mehdi, you, you write people are stubborn, reactive, overconfident, and for the most part, not going to be swayed by the facts, not going to be yeah. s- swayed by rational thinking. That seems to suggest our only hope is to appeal to their emotions. So it's not our only hope, but it's definitely a key part of the argument. And I, I, if you look at the order of my chapters, the first chapter is on the audience. The second chapter is on the importance of feelings and emotions. And the third chapter is on your receipts, on the factual evidence that you can bring to support your claims. And what I'm saying in the book is, don't give up on factual evidence. Don't fall into the Kellyanne Conway alternative facts, Rudy Giuliani, truth isn't truth, but you know, uh, post-truth world. No, facts still matter. Bring your receipts, I say. Have a logical underpinning to your argument. That's crucial. But in order to get people to take your rational arguments seriously, in order for them to even consider them, you first have to engage with them emotionally. You have to engage with them here, not just here. And I think a lot of people, and I say in the book, a lot of liberals in particular, uh, think that if you just bring enough um, evidence, if you bring enough polls, enough data, enough stats, enough peer-reviewed studies, you can win the argument. Just one more fact, and I'll have them where I want them. That's not how the human brain works. Uh, I bring forward a bunch of science that suggests that the human brain is hardwired for emotion and for narrative and for story and for passion. It is not hardwired to just absorb a ton of facts. And so facts are important, but in order to get facts through the door, in order to get facts over to your audience, you first have to connect with them emotionally. You have to engage with them very personally. I talk about the importance of telling stories, sharing personal anecdotes, finding a way to connect with your audience so that they feel like they can walk a mile in your shoes. So they feel like, oh, you are like them. They are like you, that there is a bond. You got to bond with them in order to first start giving them your numbers and your data and your stats. So facts matter. But if it's facts versus feelings, feelings win most of the time. One of the things I love about your book is that you've got so many different um, examples, both of, you know, positive outcomes and negative outcomes. Uh, You know, people who who uh, moved in the moment to do the right thing in terms of winning the argument and people who fell flat on their face. I'm, I'm wondering if you can talk about that famous Dukakis moment. So 1988, uh, the debate is in L.A. It's the presidential debate between Democrat Michael Dukakis and Republican George Bush Sr., the sitting vice president. Dukakis is governor of Massachusetts, your classic liberal, your classic rationalist. He wants to give you lots of data for his arguments. And the opening question at the debate is from Bernard Shaw, CNN anchor, who kind of asks a pretty provocative, some might say outrageous question. He says, You're opposed to the death penalty, but what if Kitty Dukakis, Michael Dukakis' wife, was brutally raped and killed? Would you still oppose the death penalty for her killer? The audience, intake of breath, the media, what was just asked here? Dukakis responds with a two-minute, 300-word-plus answer in which he goes on and on about falling crime rates in Massachusetts, the need for a hemispheric summit on drugs, the importance of funding the DEA, 
everything except what people want to hear, which is the guy who wants to be president, what's he going to do about a guy who kills his wife? Like a very personal, very uh, provocative question. Where is the emotion? Bernard Shaw says later, I asked that question to see if Dukakis had any emotion. Uh, he didn't. And his campaign manager said later, I knew we'd lost the election that night when he gave that answer. Um, it was such a robotic, flat, dull, emotionless answer. Cold. Voters wanted to see where was his passion? Where was his fight? Where was his fire? And Democrats too often lose because they don't bring that fire. They don't bring that energy to their debates. And I've made this point before, which is, there have been six presidential elections in this century of which Democrats have won three and lost three. And for me, it's no coincidence that the three who lost Al Gore, John Kerry, Hillary Clinton, were not known as inspiring orators, were not known as people who spoke with emotion or connected with people on a gut level. They were very smart, very bright, brought hundreds of policies to the table. Hillary Clinton had a policy paper on every issue, but she lost to the guy who said, build a wall, ban Muslims, lock her up. A guy who very cleverly paid to the worst emotions of his base. But I'm going to challenge you here because even if, and, you know, granted- Please a lot do, of people, I like an argument. <laughs> right, you know, a, a lot of people had issues with uh, with Hillary Clinton's charisma, especially in terms of the way it communicated over media. But one of the reasons despicable people are winning in politics around the world, not just the U.S., is because they're willing to appeal to the worst emotions in people. I'm thinking fear, rage, yeah. racism. And, you know, I, I sort of wonder whether there is an emotional appeal that can be made that counters that, given how oh, effectively those emotions hit our primitive brainstem. I think 100%. I think actually, uh, as, as negative as it can be to appeal to people's worst emotions, I don't see why Democrats and Barack Obama did this very effectively. Ronald Reagan, a Republican, did this very famously with his Morning in America. You can appeal to people's hope and aspirations. You can talk to people, you know, Barack Obama's greatest speech still uh, even though I don't agree with the content of it, but the delivery and the tone and what he struck was still, in my view, well before he became president, 2004 Democratic National Convention. Uh, he's about to be elected to the Senate and he gives this famous you know, red state, blue state America. That was a speech that was a very hopeful speech. And it's a speech that Americans love the idea of being brought together. Even in our polarized moment, we like the idea of transcending our differences, of having a common struggle, a common future, of being uh, one nation under God. And I think what people who want to push back, and I'm not just going to say Democrats because there are a few Republicans, not many, but a few who want to push back even against that kind of nativist uh, element in their party, the basest fears, you can have a hopeful and optimistic message. I think Joe Biden in some ways offered that in 2020 and did cancel out Donald Trump's fear and loathing uh, and was the right moment, e even though Joe Biden is not some great orator, but he speaks with authenticity. He speaks with passion. No one thinks he's giving you uh, talking points, which is an advantage for a politician to have. And one thing I would say is, by the way, even if you're not appealing to hope, let's take anger. People are angry in this country for many reasons. They're angry for good reasons and bad. What some on the right do, what the Trumps and Trumpists do, in my view, is to take that anger and channel it in the worst ways against the immigrant, against the Muslims, against the Mexicans, against the trans kids, against Black Lives Matter. That is what they do. I'm saying anger is a legitimate emotion. People have a lot to be angry for, for good reason. And when you look at someone like a Bernie Sanders, who's a populist on the left, he's saying, yeah, recognize the anger, but channel it in the right direction. Channel it against the point point zero one percenters who are, you know, taking a lot of the wealth of this country. Point it towards big pharma who are price gouging and screwing people over. You can channel that anger in a much more legitimate way, not against. You don't have to punch down. You don't have to go after minorities. You don't have to scapegoat some of our most vulnerable communities. So even there, even on that emotional battlefield, there are decisions that you can make. Because if you're just going to fight on a policy battlefield, you will lose. And I suppose there's an argument to be made that if you're facing somebody who keeps trying to shift the conversation, don't, you know, pay no attention to the man behind the screen. Uh, stop worrying about big pharma or big tech or big whatever. Uh, you know, I'm going to focus your attention on on the border or, you know, so many other hot button issues. Um, you as a journalist, as an interviewer, as a, you know, a debater, 
it can pull the audience's uh, attention back to the topic at hand and say, yeah. you know, whatever you want to say about that, we're talking about this. So if you said what are the two most important words in the entire book, it's an 80,000 word book, I would say the two most important words are in the chapter on gish galloping, the chapter on these BS merchants who try and steamroll you with nonsense and lies in short spaces of time and try and overwhelm you with propaganda. And there's two words that I say, don't budge, right? Too often people in our industry, Rachel, because we're time poor, we always have someone in our area saying, hurry up, hurry up, deadline, end of the show, ad break, whatever it is, we move on. We say, here's my question. They say BS. We say, okay, next question. I got I to get through my next three. I say, no, forget the next three. This is important. Get the answer to this question. Don't let that go. Don't let that lie go unanswered. Fact check in real time. Don't budge. And that has become a kind of motto of mine, which is I'm not going to move on to the next question until I get the answer to the question I asked or until I get you to concede that what you just said was not true. And I think that's so important in our current Trumpian age, this gish galloping age, where people try and just basically overwhelm you, bury you in an avalanche of deflections, distortions, distractions. And we have to say, you know what, whatever forum we're in, whether we're a politician on the debate stage, whether we're an interviewer on live TV or radio, don't budge. Now, for the benefit of people who haven't read the book yet, and and honestly, guys, you should read this book. It's it's really riveting stuff. What is gish galloping? So the gish gallop is a phrase that was uh, created by a scientist named Eugenia Scott to describe the antics, the tactics of creationist debaters, Christian creationists. Those of you who may not know, if you go on YouTube, there's a whole genre, a whole a whole uh, bunch of debates, especially in the 80s and 90s, between creationists, people who believe the Earth was created literally in seven days, uh, no evolution, and scientists, evolutionary biologists, biochemists, etc. And a lot of these creationists, especially a guy called Dwayne Gish, who has since passed away, would triumph in these debates, even though the person they were debating was eminently more qualified, knew the science inside out, but they would win in the eyes of the audience because they would just overwhelm that scientist with a blizzard of lies, uh, distortions, cherry-picked quotes, uh, misinterpreted statistics, out-of-context academic papers, and they would just throw it all, the kitchen sink. And the scientist, who maybe is not a, a trained orator who wants to talk about statistics, doesn't know how to respond to the dozens and dozens of false claims that have just been thrown out there. And the audience watching in the hall or at home on you thinks, well, maybe the creationist has a point. They said like 17 different things and the scientists didn't rebut them all. So maybe they've got a point. And then you go and you watch Donald Trump in the 2020 presidential debate against Joe Biden, where Chris Wallace is trying to stop him. In the space of two minutes, he makes a false claim every nine seconds. Now, Joe Biden and Chris Wallace, nobody on earth can fact check a claim every nine seconds. It's just not humanly possible. And that's what the gish gallop is based on. That by the time you fact check line number three or four, the gish galloper is on line number 17 or 18, and you're just overwhelmed and you're buried in, in BS. And, and I always think of the Steve Bannon quote, uh, the Trump advisor who told Michael Lewis, our opponents are not the Democratic Party, he said, they're the media. And the way you deal with the media is by flooding the zone with excrement is the, the word he used, uh, not excrement, but you know the word. I flood the zone. And that is what they've been doing for years. You know this in radio. I know this in TV. You deal with some of these people who come on the airwaves and they're not interested in good faith debate. They're interested in overwhelming you with nonsense, one lie after another, one distortion after another. And I say, pick your battle. Don't try and fight them on every lie. Don't budge. Don't just move on until you've addressed that one lie and call them out. Explain to the audience what's going on here, that this is a deliberate strategy to disorient and confuse and bamboozle. You mentioned that phrase, good faith debate. And I'm just, you know, is there such a thing in politics? <laughs> as long as I've been alive, I haven't seen it. I guess uh, in the sense that a politician is always trying to get their way and is always trying to push an agenda and isn't really going to say, well, you're right, all my policies are wrong. In that sense, a political debate, a, a narrowly political debate between two partisan actors, I guess it does lack a bit of good faith in the sense that neither of them are ever going to change their mind. But that goes back to my earlier point. It doesn't matter whether the two participants in an argument change their mind or not. 
It matters what the audience at home or the audience in the room, what happens to them. And I think you can, you and I as journalists can host good faith debates. I've hosted good faith debates between two people with two opposing views, whether it's on uh, COVID vaccinations, whether it's on um, immigration, whether it, whatever the topic is, uh, whether it's on criminal justice reform. I've had the debates on my show, good faith debates. It requires those of us in the media to find good faith actors. The problem is a lot of the shout fests that you do see on TV, they're with people who are bad faith actors. And I'm saying I'll only host a debate if I believe that these two people on two sides of the debate, they're actual experts in their field. They actually believe what they say. I don't know if people are following the Dominion lawsuit. We now know that Fox anchors, what they say on TV is not what they actually believe because they text each other the exact opposite in private. I'm saying I want people who believe this stuff, who know this stuff, who are going to argue in good faith. And I define good faith as they're going to argue sincerely. They're not going to make claims without any evidence whatsoever. They're not just going to try and talk over the other person. And they're not going to try and shift the goalposts every time they're losing. And finally, they're not going to try and win through bullying, intimidation, threats. Those are bad faith actors. Avoid them. Well, so you're describing a, a situation where, you know, as a journalist, as a, as a TV host, you have the power to choose who you have come on the show. We have an, an audience uh, question, and I want to encourage everyone who, who's got one burning to just put that in the comment section because I am getting fed them. A uh, question, if you could make changes to the format of the U.S. presidential and VP debates, what would they be and why? Ooh, that is a great question. That is a fantastic question. Um, well, first, I mean, the problem is, of course, the system is kind of rigged in the sense that the parties have a veto over what the broadcasters can do and what the Commission on Presidential Debates can do. I would like to reform the entire system. I know Trump wants to reform this. He wants to do it for his own self-interest. I do think that it would be great. I mean, the best thing you could have in a debate is a fact check, right? What more useful thing could you have in a debate than someone fact checking the claims that are made? rather than allowing two sides just to say nonsense. And we know that people don't maybe not realize this, but presidential debate moderators are not allowed to fact check. They're literally not allowed by the rules. They're allowed to control the time. Allow what they, you know, We're not allowed as journalists to do our job and say, that's not true. Or here's some evidence. They're supposed to stay out of it and let. And in the old days, maybe that worked. In the age of Trump, doesn't work at all, as we saw in 2020 and 2016. So I would like to find a role for a fact checker. Actually, if, if people who have long memories will remember 2012, if memory serves me correctly, I can't remember which debate, it may have been the second debate. Barack Obama and Mitt Romney are debating about Benghazi. And Obama makes a claim about whether it was called a terrorist attack or not by the White House. And Romney says it wasn't. And Candy Crowley, then of CNN, was moderating. And she jumps in and says, well, actually, I was there. It was called, it was, I think she says it was called a terrorist attack. I can't remember the exact, she fact checks them. Oh, people lost their minds. How dare she do that? That goes against the rules. Can you imagine a journalist being told off for literally doing their job? So I think the debates need to be reformatted as a place where journalism can take place, where fact checks can occur. And if you know, if you're not a serial fabricator, what are you afraid of? So so let's imagine that you're counseling a politician who's uh, approaching one of these uh, debates in good faith, as hard as that is to imagine, and, you know, <laughs> going up against somebody who's definitely not and likely to spew a lot of lies or misrepresentations at the very least. What would your counsel be to that person? How, how do you counter, given that you're not going to have any support from from the journalist who's moderating the event? So a couple of things. Um Number one, less is more. Don't go in and try and win every argument. And it's the title of my book. The, the way to win that argument on that night is to pick one argument to win, one claim to make. So, for example, if you're in a presidential debate, is there a specific economic policy or a specific claim that your opponents made that you want to focus on? Just laser-like, hone in on that. Have your receipts ready. My chapter three of the book, have your evidence ready to say, well, actually, here are the facts. Have your story ready. Have you got a story to tell to really engage people on this so it's not some abstract notion, chapter two of the book? Have you got a good, um, have you got, are you able to challenge the credibility of your opponent? Why he shouldn't be trusted? Why they don't have the expertise to say what they're saying? That's uh, the chapter on ad hominem attacks. I make a defense of ad hominem attacks. Have you got some humor? Uh, another chapter of the book. Have you got a one-liner, something I highly recommend everyone has in any forum, uh, a zinger. The chapter is called The Art of the Zinger, and we've seen presidential debate zingers. Lloyd Benson's famous uh, line to uh, uh, Quayle, 
1988 VP debate. I knew Jack Kennedy, you're no Jack Kennedy. Memorable, classic line, shut up, quail, in the middle of that debate. So have all of those tips and techniques ready. But if you're up against a Trumpian figure, a Gish Galloper, you need one extra point, which is be ready not to budge. Don't budge. Have your one issue. The other person will try and run from that issue. Don't let them run. Just keep going back. Keep going back. I always give the example of... Um, Jeremy Paxman, the famous British BBC journalist, interviewer, legendary interviewer, attack dog. When I was growing up in the UK, he was a kind of hero of mine. And he famously interviewed a British politician called Michael Howard, a conservative politician who had just fired a prison governor. It was a huge scandal in the 90s. And he asked him the same question, I think, 12 or 13 times. 12 or 13, again and again, because politics kept dodging it and he kept asking it, kept re-asking it. That's what you got to do. It's awkward. People don't like to do it. It makes you feel a little bit icky, a little bit rude. doesn't matter. you got to do it because the other person won't know what to do. One last quick thing is, with someone like Trump, I always wonder why, and Rachel, you may, you, you may agree or not agree with me, I've always enjoyed the idea that if only a journalist would stand up at a press conference and just ask him fact questions. What does NATO stand for, Mr. President? What is the WHO? When are you going to Wakanda? Those are the kind of questions I'd love to hear him try and answer. Well, you know, I'd, I'd like to hear you talk about another piece of advice you offer in the book, which is pay attention to whoever has the mic. We don't, as a rule, generally listen when other people are talking. We're, yeah. we're waiting to say something ourselves. Exactly. And if you're listening, you can hear when people are dodging the question or saying something that's patently false that can be called out. Yeah, as you say, we are waiting. We're waiting for our turn. What we call listening is really us waiting for our turn to speak. And that's a huge mistake. It's a mistake for um, multiple reasons. Uh, from a self-interested point of view, if you're not listening, you're not paying attention, then you're going to miss something you, that you need to rebut or counter. You might miss a lie that was told or an inconsistency that was offered, something that you could pounce on. One of the things I try and do is really, really listen out for something that I can challenge and come back in on. Um, if you're not paying attention, you can't do that. So critical listening is important, just as critical thinking is important. And then there's empathetic listening. As I say in the book, the highest form of listening, to quote the great Stephen Covey, the idea that you're also listening with your eyes and with your heart, you're present, you're engaging with someone at the most uh, deepest of levels, the, you know, an audience member. If you're, a, if, you're a, if you're in a public event and someone in the audience is speaking, really you want to take that person seriously. You want that person to feel felt uh, seen and heard. And I give the example in the book of Bill Clinton in 1992 at the Richmond Town Hall, the first presidential town hall in American history, where George Bush Sr. is asked a question by an audience member uh, how does the national debt affect you personally? And first, Bush Sr. looks at his watch while she's asking the question because he wants to go home. He's not interested in being there. No empathy. And then he gives some long, boring answer about interest rates. Again, she's asking the audience member, you personally, how did it affect you? Bush doesn't engage. He's not listening. Bill Clinton gets off his stool, walks right over to the lady, looks her in the eye and says, how does it affect you personally? And she gets to speak. And Bill Clinton is the master of empathy. It's why he was such a great speaker when he was president, when he was running for president. And that skill, that wins you over, that, that wins over an entire audience in the blink of an eye. Here's another great question from the audience. Can you talk about one of your, your biggest learning moments after an interview or, an, or a debate that might not have gone well or uh, as planned? So I, w w one of the main lessons, one of the things I struggle hard with is I am a very passionate person, maybe too passionate. So I get really involved in my interviews, my debates, my conversations. Like I will get into an intense argument over which flavor of chocolate ice cream we're going to have for dessert after a meal. Like I will get red, I will, I will argue that. So I take everything very seriously, sometimes too seriously. So my big challenge, and I have a chapter in the book on this, and I wrote this chapter really for myself as an advice to myself, but also I hope to readers, which is keep calm and carry on. And I talk in the book about the importance of staying cool, calm, and collected, even when your opponent is baiting you, even when uh, somebody's trying to wind you up, even when someone said something so egregious, so offensive, don't let it get a rise out of you. And sometimes you will see in some of my interviews, the interviewee, uh, I've had interviews, very smart interviewees who will stay super cool and I might get worked up and they will use that against me and say, Eddie, why are you getting so worked up? I'm not getting worked out. The minute you say that, you've lost. You've lost. The minute they've got you even to deny that you're worked up or angry, you've lost. So for me, it's always a case of how do you stay calm? Don't get carried away. Don't talk over the other person. All things I do naturally. 
Um, I also talk in the book about my facial expressions. Um, you have to work a lot on how you look, your body language, um, your eye contact, your facial expression. I make a joke that I have RAMF. I have resting angry Muslim face. Uh, it's something that I have to deal with. You know, there's a lot of prejudices coming with a brown Muslim man. And one of them is I look angry when I'm paying attention really seriously. People in my ear will say, you look really angry. Look, you want to kill the other person. I'm not. I'm just paying attention. But that's my resting face. So those are the kind of things I have to work on. I come out of interviews and people say, that was good. But did you notice that? You, you, and I was like, yes. So I, I try and focus a lot on how do I sound? How do I come across? Am I looking too aggressive? Am I sounding too angry? That's the kind of stuff I work very hard on because often I'll be like, I wasn't angry at all, but you sounded angry. Damn it. You know, if you're if you're overcome by emotions, any kind of emotion, uh, if you're unable to keep your cool, uh, you can't hear what the other person is saying and respond effectively. But also, you you can't be funny, and and yeah. oftentimes the best way to win an argument is is to yes. make fun of the other person or their argument. So true. And I say in the book, in the chapter that's called uh, Keep Calm and Carry On, I say there are three tried and tested methods. And I always have three reasons for everything. I have a chapter called The Rule of Three. I say there are three reasons, three ways, sorry, that you can stay calm, tried and tested. One is through breathing, basic stuff, take a deep breath, slow everything down. The science is rock solid on this and goes back millennia. Number two is humor. That humor is the best way to diffuse tension and also to calm yourself down and make a joke at your own expense. Self-deprecating humor is a very good thing to do when you're in a tough spot or you feel like you've let yourself down. And um, the third point is talking to yourself, self-talk. People think it's crazy. First sign of madness to talk to yourself. Actually, no, the science from the University of Michigan and Michigan State suggests that if you talk to yourself in the third person, it's a very good way of keeping calm. So maybe you got this and you're saying to yourself in your head as you're in the middle of this intense exchange with some politician, that actually works. Now, you just mentioned uh, something about three. To quote Delisol, three is a magic number. Why is that? So this is so fascinating. It's something I've kind of always instinctively done. Uh, I say in the book, like, I have three reasons for everything. Friends of mine, my family members get annoyed at me. It's like, okay, we get it. You just need to have one reason. You don't need three reasons for why you want to go to this particular restaurant. Um, so, And then when I was writing the book, I started digging deeper into this. And I discovered that there's a whole bunch of science behind this. And I interviewed um, uh, a scientist called Professor Nelson Cowan at the University of Missouri, who talked, who's done a lot of work on the human brain, on human memory, on how we remember. And three is the number that enables you to remember. It's what keeps things memorable, engaging. If somebody gives you three reasons, if somebody gives you three factors, if somebody gives you uh, three things to do, that is the number that you'll re remember, not two, not four, not five. It's three, and people have different th theories for why it's three. Is three the smallest number that allows you to see a pattern? You know, one or two, coincidence, three, then you start to see patterns. But whatever it is, and, and it's ingrained in us from childhood. Think about all of our nursery rhymes and stories. You know, the three little pigs, the three billy goats gruff, three blind mice, right from our childhood, three, three, three. So I say, Use three uh, as a way of explaining yourself. Use three for structure. You know, when you're making an argument or writing an essay or writing a speech or giving remarks, you have a beginning, a middle, and an end, right? You always have to have a three-part structure. It's how the audience follows along. It's how the audience remembers. It is really the magic number when it comes to rhetoric and persuasion. It is so interesting. Like it, I, One thing I would suggest to listeners is imagine trying to make a persuasive argument using a different number. You know, if you try to do it with five, uh, you'll see people's eyes glazing over. It's just too much. If you try to do yeah. it with four, same thing. Try to do it with two, and it just... It works, but not in quite a, yeah. in a, as look, effective a way. You're one. looking for one more. It's yeah. a, there's a sense of completion with three, which I think, again, goes back to our childhood. Um, and, you know, Nelson Cowan, who I mentioned, he does running span memory tests, which basically is you give people a bunch of items, a list of things to remember, and they remember the last three. After three, they struggle. So it's really interesting, the science that's behind it. You look at our childhood stories, but either way, it's a fantastic way of organizing your thoughts, of structuring your arguments, your essays, your remarks. Um, and it's a great way of just getting people to remember. Here, I'm, you know, I'm going to tell you, I'm going to tell you three things today. And Steve Jobs, who is considered one of the great persuaders in the business world, the former, uh, the late CEO and founder of Apple, he gave the Stanford commencement speech, which is the most watched commencement speech in American history. You go on YouTube, tens of millions of views. And he starts by saying, I just want to tell you three stories today. Three. 
you know, you grew up in a household that enjoyed verbal combat, uh, right? Which, uh, but so, so many people, especially Americans, do not grow up in that kind of a household. In fact, they're they're taught from an early age: don't bring up politics, don't bring up religion, yeah. <laughs> you know, don't get yes. your uncle started. You know, like it, it's uh, yeah. it's really hard to overcome uh, that desire, especially on the part of Americans, to to be conflict averse. Yeah, and I think I made jokes before that maybe maybe my interview style stands out in U.S. Uh, media because I'm from the U.K. and we're British and we're happy to get in your face and be rude uh, and be blunt. But um, it is important as interviewers, as journalists to do that. But I think even as ordinary citizens, I would say two things. One is democracy cannot survive unless we're willing to have good faith debate and argument and not run away from things that we disagree about, but try and find some common ground or at least try and persuade our fellow citizens. That's number one. Number two, in an age of Trumpism, in an age of growing authoritarianism, where democracy is literally under threat, I don't think we can hide from debate and argument anymore. I don't think we can say, you know what, I'm just going to keep my head down and I'll be over there in the corner. I'm not interested in having that. You know, don't talk about politics. I think in the last few years, it's become very hard for Americans to avoid talking about politics. It's everywhere. So I'm saying equip yourself for that. You're not going to be able to avoid it. And number three, because I have to have three reasons. Number three, I genuinely think a lot of people would enjoy debate and argument if they were equipped for it. I think everyone wants to win an argument at some point. I think people are afraid of losing. And I wrote this book to say, actually, anyone can win an argument. Let me show you how. An audience member asked, you mentioned being passionate. <laughs> were you like that as a child? You remember early debates with your parents. What were they about? What What about the last thing you debated about with your children? Um, that's gr a great question. So yeah, I do remember always debating and arguing as a child. I say in the book that I give a lot of credit to my father uh, who encouraged my sister and I to kind of challenge him, challenge our political beliefs, our religious beliefs, have open-ended discussions, not be afraid to question things. Uh, again, critical thinking, so important. Uh, a lost art in some ways, uh, especially among young people today. Um, so I do remember, I, I, have, I, have, I have a very vivid memory of arguing with my parents over whether I, me or my sister should be the one to empty the dishwasher. And I think I won that argument. I managed to get her to do it. Um, <laughs> but in terms of my kids, my kids are great debaters. I'm scared that they've now read the book and I've given them extra ammo. I was at a book signing in Texas on Saturday and a bunch of people said, we're buying this for our kids. And I just wrote in the book, don't use this on your parents. Uh, thinking, oh, their parents are in trouble now because uh, kids are, are great at debating. Um, uh, my daughter, actually, my younger daughter uh, keeps arguing with me about how the next book should be a book for kids specifically. It should be a young reader's version of this book. Uh, specifically tailored to how kids can beat their parents in an argument. So they're very keen to have these debates and win against older people. My, yeah. my older daughter's in high school debate, and that's a whole different ball game. High school debate is very interesting, very structured. And I say, some of the stuff in this book, it can't be used in high school debate. It's more for the real world. This is a, a how-to manual you, you've written here, Mehdi. I'm, I'm wondering if there's any part of you that lies awake at night worrying that you've put out a weapon into the world, a weapon <laughs> that can be used by horrible people. And used against me. My daughter said to me, why would you give away all your secrets? Now people are going to know what you're doing. And I was like, that's fine. I mean, we'll see if everyone can follow the tips. And have I given away all of them? Uh, Congressman Ro Khanna from the Bay Area um, he tweeted a few weeks ago, I'm going to buy Mary Hudson's book, read it before I go on a show next time. So maybe I've maybe I've uh, really shot myself in the foot. Let's see. In my generosity and my desperation to share with the world what I think is so important about public speaking and debating. Um, yes, can it be misused? Surely it can. But I would argue that I would hope that the people who buy and read this book are able to take away the positive messages from the book and use it to, you know, really... I say in the book, you can use the stuff in this book to negotiate a pay rise for yourself, to do better in school. And it's not just about politics. Yes, it helps in the media. Yes, there's some grand big themes about saving democracy and about the media being more um, uh, tougher and holding people to account. But it's also a book for whether you want to go and ask your boss for a pay rise. It's also a book for whether you want to do better in the high school debate. It's also a book for whether you just want to be a more confident person. I wrote a whole chapter about how you improve and build your confidence because there's no more important trait. There's no more important skill that you need in order to stand up and address a crowd than confidence. If you're not confident, 
everything else is a waste of time. There's no point trying to do anything else in the book unless you've worked hard in building up your confidence and worked at it. Uh, you know, I, 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 there's a famous statistic that for Americans, the biggest fear is standing in front of a crowd, speaking in front of an audience. That's the number one fear, according to polls. Number two is dying, right? Dying is the second biggest fear. Speaking in front of a crowd is the first biggest fear. So to quote Jerry Seinfeld, if you're at a funeral, you'd rather be in the casket than giving the eulogy, which tells you how much we need Americans to work on their confidence in order to stand up and speak in front of people, which is such a vital life skill. You've raised a, a couple of points there I, I want to unpack. For one thing, right, you, you write a lot about dominating a debate, dominating a room. But but frankly, that this approach to conversation can prove quite toxic in a number of contexts. I'm thinking a marriage, for instance, or even the office. Yeah. Outside of journalism, outside of politics and the law and high school debate, where is it valuable to know how to win an argument? It's a great question. So uh, let me deal with the marriage point first. Innumerable people have asked me the question, will this book help me win an argument with my wife slash husband? And I say, no. I say, this is not for that. I mean, it could, but don't try it. In fact, I dedicate the book in the very first page to my wife, who I say is the only person I can never seem to win an argument with. So when people say, oh, do you want everyone to win every argument? No, not at all. There are some arguments you should probably avoid. So, um, but you're, you're right to highlight where it's needed. And I would go back to say, there are so many, there is no walk of life in which being able to persuade someone isn't an important life skill or soft skill in the careers market. I mean, Winston Churchill talked about the power of rhetoric being more durable than that of a great king, the ability to change people's minds, sway hearts, uh, convince the masses. And that works even at a tiny level, even if you're trying to convince your kids to do something, even if you're trying to persuade your friends to do something, even if, as I say, you're trying to negotiate a pay rise or secure a job interview, or you're around the boardroom trying to get a deal done. The ability to be able to play to the gallery, as you said earlier, to uh, engage with someone emotionally and find common ground, the ability to deploy receipts, show your evidence, have command of facts and figures at the right time. The uh, the judgment call as to when it's the right moment to crack a joke and get someone on board with humor, break down some of those barriers with some self-deprecating jokes. All of that, I think, is useful across the board, whether you're in school, whether you're in college, whether you're in the workplace, whether you're hanging out with friends. The idea, I mean, we all, I say this in the start of the book, at some point, every man, woman, and child on planet Earth has tried to win an argument, has needed to win an argument, has wanted to win an argument. And the problem is we think we can't. I wrote the book to say, actually, anyone can win an argument. I genuinely believe that. You know, given that you grew up in the UK, you, you've got a special perspective that you bring to this subject. You know, so many Britons love a good debate, you know, in journalism and politics. I'm going to put you on the spot here. Do you think the media here in the US is too concerned with access to power? Are, are we, because of our common reluctance to enter into an open argument, uh, lap dogs when we should be guard dogs? I've said for a while that I wish the US media was more confrontational, more combative across the board, especially at a time when small d democracy is at stake. You know, we've had this debate for years, Rachel, I'm sure you've had it in your newsrooms about bias and about not taking a position in the famous journalism school view from nowhere. And I think journalists need to understand that we have skin in the game. We are the fourth estate. We are the guarantors, the guard dogs of democracy. And if democracy is under threat, then it's time to get off that fence and say, you know what? Actually, we are partisans. We're partisans in favor of small D democracy, not the big D democratic party, but small D democracy. Um, because if democracy dies, we die. And if democracy is to survive, we need to survive. So I think that's a very important point for us all to internalize. I think some people have done that in recent years. It's taken far too long, but better late than never. I do think we need tougher interviews uh, with people who are gaslighting us. Uh, there is so much dishonesty. You know, we have a big election lie that now dominates one of our two political parties. People literally claiming up is down, hot is cold, black is white. And journalists shouldn't be saying, well, you know, both the other side says this. Some people say, no, two plus two is four. We should be able to say that confidently. I, I've always said the job of a journalist, if two people are arguing over whether it's raining outside, one person says it's raining, the other says it's not raining. The job of the journalist is not to report well, one person says it's raining, 
The other person says it's not. The job of the journalist is to open the window, look outside and check whether it's raining or not. So I do think that is so important right now to be able to speak some plain truths. And yes, I, again, it's improving in the age of Trump. The silver lining of the Trump era is that journalists have realized actually we need to up our game in terms of being more challenging with the people who are coming on our channels to gaslight us. But it's we need to do much more of it. We need to be much more um, tougher in our approach, less deferential um, and less willing to be steamrolled. One member of our audience asked, the landscape of journalism has changed greatly in the last five to 10 years. Looking towards the next five to 10 years, are there things that worry or excite you? That's a great question. I mean, the things that worry me, of course, is uh, declining audiences as audiences get fragmented, as young people basically get all their news from social media, some of which isn't reliable. Um, all of that, of course, weighs on me and the trust factor, you know, uh, people just not believing uh, in the media, partly through media self-inflicted wounds, through mistakes that we, our industry has made, but also through a concerted, deliberate, bad faith, cynical campaign by some on the right to discredit the mainstream media so that they can get away with their lives more easily. So that all weighs on me heavily all the time. And I wonder, like, how long is this going to survive? How long are we going to carry on like this? Because we've got entire young generations growing up not understanding how to distinguish between good faith and bad faith argument, how to distinguish between credible and not credible sources of information, how to ascertain the truth um, in this crowded marketplace of ideas and information and misinformation. So that worries me. Um, in terms of optimism, I would say that every time we've had some new technology, there have been upsides. I mean, I you know, as damaging as social media has been in terms of affecting our attention spans in spreading quote unquote fake news, um, in creating online toxic mobs, uh, reinforcing our tribalism, the upside has been that we've been able to reach people that we couldn't reach before. Like my platform that I have on TikTok allows me to reach people. I did a I did a video last week on my book tour, which has had 1.2 million views on TikTok over the last few days. 1.2 million views. Those people were not seeing that content on my cable show or even my streaming show, but they're seeing it on TikTok. They're seeing it on Instagram. So I go to, I, you know, I take my journalism to where it needs to go. I take it to where the people are. And I'm, high, I'm heartened by the fact that even when I do a 25 minute monologue on some topic, whether it's the debt crisis or whether it's Marjorie Taylor Greene's career, we're seeing really good results in terms of people are watching. You know, this whole idea that people aren't interested in anything long form, that's just not true. I don't think we should let that become a self-fulfilling prophecy. So I'm heartened by the fact that while audiences are falling, the people who are tuning in are tuning in for longer. They're appreciating some of the deep dives that me and my team are doing, at least on MSNBC and on Peacock. Well, it, it sounds to some extent like you've got a self-selecting audience there, the people who really want to get into the nitty gritty of the details. Uh, our next question asker sa asks, how does a debater deal with an opponent who believes everything is either good or evil, black or white, no shades of gray? It's a great question. Again, well, two things. Number one, your job is to introduce that nuance. So you need to be prepared to make the case for nuance. When you want to say it's gray, what are your receipts? What are you bringing to the table? What have you brainstormed, as I say in the book? Have you steel manned your opponent's argument? Maybe it is good and evil. Maybe it is that simple, or maybe it's not. So are you prepared with your own arguments? To quote John Stuart Mill, if you only know your own side of the argument, you don't really know the argument at all. Do you know the other side? Uh, and the other point I would make is, again, who is your audience? What is your goal? One thing I say very clearly, and every time I talk about the book, I, I remind viewers and readers, when you win an argument, when you want to win an argument, it depends who you're arguing with, where you're arguing, what are you arguing about, who's your target audience, what is your goal? Context matters so much. If I'm a prosecutor in a courtroom, I'm going to take a very different approach to whether I'm sitting at that Thanksgiving table with my MAGA uncle. It's You have to start in a very different place. You have to understand what your goal is. So maybe the person who's talking good and evil, maybe that's not the person you're trying to convince. I interviewed John Bolton on my show. It's one of the viral moments I talk about in the book. I wasn't trying to change John Bolton's mind. I didn't go into that interview thinking, I'm going to persuade John Bolton that the Iraq war was wrong. No, of course not. He's never going to concede that. My point was to show the audience that here are arguments about the Iraq war that John Bolton may not have considered 
and that I want to press him on and that the audience at home may not have considered. That was my goal in that interview. So you've got to understand who are you trying to convince and persuade and why? You have to ask yourself those questions before you sit down to prepare your remarks. You know, are you going into, um, uh, are you giving, a, are, you, are, you giving you know, are you giving a speech at a funeral? You're giving a eulogy about a friend that passed away sadly? Those remarks and the tone and tenor of those remarks are going to be very different to the presentation you're giving in the boardroom as you try and convince colleagues at work to back your proposal for a deal or a merger. I'm wondering if you can break down how a great orator, I'm thinking Martin Luther King Jr. or Winston Churchill or Abe Lincoln, how a great orator went through that thinking process clearly in order to arrive at a speech that uh, convinced a lot of people who might have needed to be swayed to move in a yeah. certain direction versus another. So we assume that some of those people you just mentioned were kind of natural born orators. We can never be like MLK or Churchill. I mean, Churchill won World War II with his rhetoric. And yet, as I point out in the book, Churchill as a younger man in his 20s was a poor orator. He had a stutter and a stammer. Uh, people made fun of the way he spoke. There was a moment in the House of Commons and you've seen the House of Commons at Question Time. It's a very aggressive, belligerent place where he gets shouted down and heckled because he loses his way during a speech and he can't remember what he wants to say. And he spends the next 10, 20, 30 years improving himself as a debater and orator to the point where we now remember him only as the fight them on the beaches guy, the guy who inspired a nation to stand up to Hitler against the odds. But he wasn't always that person. Uh, you know, There's a story I tell in the book where his valet runs to the bathroom because he hears him calling him. He says, sir, you called. And he says, Norman, I wasn't talking to you. I was talking to the House of Commons. Churchill practiced his speeches to the Commons while sitting in his bathtub. And you and I think we can just wing it when we have to give a speech. Uh, MLK, he gives his I have a dream speech. Um, and yet that is a speech that he, some of it, yes, off the cuff. We know that some of it he just improvises. But a lot of that speech had been tried and tested at dozens of venues across the country. He had started small. He didn't just turn up at Lincoln Memorial and give that speech. He tested out on audiences. He saw their reactions. In fact, Gary Young writes in his book on MLK's speech that the night before he's up to what, two, three, four a.m. making last minute changes in the margins. That's how committed he was to getting every word perfect. Abraham Lincoln, before he gives the Gettysburg Address, calls on the architect of the cemetery to give him the plans for the cemetery so he can see how the how it's laid out and where the crowd will be standing and where he'll be standing. He didn't leave anything to chance. So I urge people watching at home, don't cut corners. Don't try and wing it. Put in the work. Put in the preparation. I've devoted two entire chapters of the book to the importance of preparing, uh, practice, delivery. A question asker asks, what is the best piece of professional advice that you've received and who is it from? That is a great question. Um, that is a fantastic question. Let me think about that for a second, because I've been blessed to have some great mentors, interviewers I've worked with, bosses. I quote uh, some of them in the in the show, um, in the book, apologies. Um, I think, well, I've had multiple pieces of advice, but in, in reference to what we're talking about, I talk about uh, Jonathan Dimbleby in the book, and he blurred the UK edition. He's a very famous British interviewer legendary uh, media broadcasting family. And I was a researcher on his Sunday show. So I, one of my first jobs in the media in the UK was, was working as a researcher for a famous Sunday morning interviewer. So I learned a lot from him, which I incorporated into my own career. And one thing he always used to say was be forensic. And I say that in the book, be forensic. One of the reasons I've succeeded in what I do is because I am very specific and deliberate. I want to cross every T, dot every I. If you give me a statistic, I'm going to check that statistics correct. I won't let you just fudge an answer. I want to be very clear. What are you saying there? Is that a yes or is that a no? Or is that a maybe? Well, I want to be very exact because, again, to go back to what we talked about earlier, the gish galloper, the BS artist, the con man, they want to just quickly, quickly brush past with some vague sweeping assertion. So much of what passes for an uh, interview on TV these days is someone just saying something vague and generic and no one calling them out. I want to get to the heart of it. When I interviewed Eric Prince, it was an interview that went viral. It ended up with him being referred to the DOJ for investigation by Adam Schiff. That's the interview where a lot of Americans discovered me for the first time in 20, I think it was 2018, 19, can't remember the exact year. When I went after Prince, I went after him on a very specific line. Did you say X, Y, Z in your testimony to the House Intelligence Committee? I may have done. Well, did you? I think I did. Well, it's not in the transcript. I brought the transcript. 
Well, maybe they didn't transcribe it properly. Maybe they didn't transcribe it, but it's not. We went through the whole thing. It was very forensic. And he didn't know what to do because he'd never been cornered in that way where someone wasn't just moving on to the next topic. They were actually spending five, 10 minutes going through the transcript of remarks he had given earlier. So I say be forensic, be exact, be de detailed, be precise. This is a great question again from the audience. Mehdi, if you had the opportunity to debate President Vladimir Putin, Elon Musk, Kellyanne Conway, President Barack Obama. What would you want to talk about? And also feel free to pick one or someone else. Ooh, those are some great people. Um, I've Of all those people, I've actually tried to get an interview with Elon Musk, but surprisingly, he doesn't want to do it. I'm shocked. Um, so... Well, let's just talk about, let's, let's, let's be forensic. Let's be very forensic. I would want to put them on the spot with one specific question, which I believe they don't really have a considered response for. And I would want to spend a lot of time working on that one area, pushing them on that one area. So for example, Vladimir Putin. Vladimir Putin, 20 years ago, did the right thing. He opposed the invasion of Iran. He very forcefully said, it's an illegal invasion. It's a violation of Iraqi national sovereignty. No country has the right to invade another. I would spend some time talking to Vladimir Putin about Iraq. You could call it a booby trap. I have a chapter on booby traps. I would establish with him that he was right. No country has the right to illegally invade Iraq. So why did he illegally invade Ukraine? And I would use the Iraq analogy to push him on that because I don't think he would be expecting that. I don't think he has an answer to that because it's clear hypocrisy what's going on in Ukraine. Uh, with someone like Elon Musk, I would just want to do fact stuff. He says so many things Trump style that aren't true. For example, when Paul Pelosi was violently attacked in his home in San Francisco, Elon Musk posted a conspiracy, a homophobic conspiracy theory from a fake news website. And then when he got attacked for it, he quietly deleted it and never brought it up again. He's never been asked about it. He's never had to explain himself. For me, I would say, why did you post that? Where did you find it? Why have you not apologized? And I wouldn't move on until we got to the bottom of that incident. So I, it's again, it's all about picking your battles, not budging, calling them out. That same three-pronged strategy applies across the board. And again, with people like Obama, when I interview people, I try and think, what have they not been asked? I don't want to ask the same questions that everyone else asks. What have they not been asked? What are they not expecting? What do they probably not have an answer for? So I'd have to think about someone like Obama. What is the really interesting angle today uh, that you could explore with Barack Obama? Um, similarly with, with the others who were mentioned. And I think that's what I always try. When I interviewed John Bolton, I knew that people had asked him multiple questions about the Iraq. Well, what could I ask him about Iraq that he hadn't been asked? What could I ask him about Iran that he hadn't been asked? And he wasn't expecting it. I think you've gone some way to answering this next question, but I'll ask it nonetheless. Is it worth debating someone if you know that person will just respond with untruthful info? Such a great question. And I feel very strong on this one, which is, you know, people say, again, why did you write a book called Win Every Argument? Do you really want to win every argument? Well, number one, no, not with your spouse. And number two, not with gaslighters, not with, what, with the gish gallopers. My position is, that bad faith actors don't deserve a platform, shouldn't be granted a platform. About a decade ago, I did an Al Jazeera show where I had a climate change denier on the show because I thought, well, let's have the argument. It was a disaster. You can't debate with conspiracy theorists. And after that, I learned my lesson and said, I'm not doing that again. And today my policy is I won't have climate change deniers on the show. I won't have Holocaust deniers on the show. I won't have election deniers on the show, which makes it very difficult to book Republican Party politicians because the majority of them are election deniers these days. And it's, you know, I call it a hygiene test. I want to keep my show clean uh, and tidy. And I want to have good faith arguments because look, I want to argue with people about what's the right tax rate? Is the immigration policy working? Uh, you know, should we uh, invade this or that country? Uh, should we be supporting this or that country? What is the right education policy, et cetera, et cetera? We can have good faith debates, but I'm not gonna argue whether up is down, black is white, hot is cold. I won't argue reality. And I'm not gonna platform someone who's, who's a, you know, so people say, would you interview Marjorie Taylor Greene? I would say, no, what would be the point of that conversation? She doesn't believe half the stuff she says, and the other half is offensive, bigoted, and nuts. So why would I give her a live platform in particular where I wouldn't be able to fact check her in real time and she'd have a platform to spew nonsense. It might make for great ratings, might go viral, but I would feel 
feel uh, deeply ashamed uh, that I allowed my platform to be used and abused in that way. So no, I won't. There are certain people I won't argue because I don't think it's a good faith discussion, um, even if you are going to get eyeballs, even if you are going to get audiences. So no, that there are there are limits to who you should argue. But what you're describing here... When's the right here, time to walk away from an argument? Right, like exactly, right? But you're describing here a, a, a gated paradise of sorts. And, you know, it, I, I'm wondering what advice you would give to... Uh, general interest or headline news programs, or for that matter, you know, Mark Zuckerberg over at uh, at Meta, you know, uh, much of politics today is filled with, you know, uh, confusion, dissension, uh, people who are are not good faith are arguers yeah. of any position. Uh, should should they just not dis- discuss what's happening in the news, not not discuss what's happening among power brokers? It's a, really good, it's, it's a really hard question to grapple. I'm sure you grapple with it, Rachel, with your colleagues. I've grappled with it with my team. Even this position I have where I won't have an election today on my show, it's a really hard position to maintain because I want to have certain politicians on. And then I'm like, wow, they're an election denier. And I've got, I've got to stick to my principles. As we get closer to the presidential election in 24, maybe I'll have to drop that position because if one, if we have a two-party system and one of our two main parties has been taken over with conspiracy theorists and election deniers, then you're basically saying, by saying I won't have an election denier on, you're saying I won't have any Republicans on. And that's hard for a journalist to say, even an opinion journalist such as myself. I had Congressman Dan Crenshaw on my show, very right-wing Republican uh, Trump supporter. And yet I asked him at the beginning of the interview, do you believe Joe Biden won the election? Yes, I do. Okay, we can continue. Had he said no, I wouldn't have had him on the show. I'd already checked and seen that he didn't vote to overturn on January the 6th. So, but, you know, it's a tricky, really tricky scene. And I don't think there's a right answer. I do think we should try our best to hold the line, right? We have to hold. If we don't hold the line, who will? For reality, for truth, for facts. Um, if we just say, you know what? Both sides. You know what? He said, she said. Uh, we are betraying our readers and our viewers. We have a responsibility to the truth more than to anything else. There are things you can do to try and cut back on the disinformation. Just one small uh, tip or one small uh, good practice that I want to praise. Jonathan Carl of ABC did an interview with Carrie Lake um, prior to the gubernatorial election in Arizona, this kind of mini Trump who's refused to accept her defeat. And not an interview I would have done, but each to their own. The way he did it, I thought was smart. He interviewed her not live on Sunday morning. He interviewed her pre-taped. And as she said every bit of nonsense, they cut away. And you had the voice of God narrator from Jonathan Carl saying, actually, what she said is not true. Here's what we track checked. Here's the actual reality. Then they went back to the interview. I think that's what we got to do now. If you're going to have these people on, don't have them on live. Pre-tape it, package it up, give context to the viewer or the listener or the reader. Give the facts. Do the truth sandwich, which is you say the truth first, then you allow the lie to be said, then you bring up the truth again. It's the only way to protect the public, a democratic audience, a small d democratic audience. Well, we have a tradition here at the Commonwealth Club uh, of asking speakers this last question. What is your 60 second idea to change the world? Wow, what is my 60 second idea to change the world? Ooh. <laughs> That is a great question. Let me think for a second before I do six seconds on that. What is my six second idea to change the world? Hmm. So I would say that I genuinely believe that some an issue that I feel strongly about is foreign conflict. We get into too many wars, wars that we can't get out of. And I believe that politicians, generals, arms companies uh, have been far too keen to get us entangled in foreign conflicts. And not just in America, I think the same applies in Britain and other, especially Western countries. Um, and I would like to see a, uh, a mechanism I would like, whether it's a congressional vote here in the US, which used to be the case, the War Powers Act, but I would like to see democratic mechanisms enforced so that the citizenry and the population have a bigger say in whether we go to war or not. Right now, whether countries go to war is a preserve of one leader, maybe a handful of leaders, occasionally a vote in the legislature. I think everywhere 
Uh, it should be bound by a democratic vote. I think the people should decide whether we send our young men and women to die in faraway conflicts without good reason in endless wars. And so I think any mechanism that makes it harder for us to go to war, whether it's a vote in Congress, whether it's some kind of referendum, anything that allows uh, input from the population, I think, I don't think people want to go to war. I don't think Amer most Americans want to go to war. And I think Anything that makes it more, that decision, again, more small D democratic that encourages debate, open good faith debate about an issue. We're, 20, we're at the 20th anniversary this month of the Iraq invasion. If only we'd had more good faith debate, if only the media had done their job, then yes, I think we could save a lot of lives globally. Well, our thanks to Mehdi Hassan, author of Win Every Argument, The Art of Debating, Persuading, and Public Speaking. We encourage everyone to pick up a copy of Mehdi's book at your local bookstore. If you'd like to watch more programs or support the Commonwealth Club's efforts in making virtual and in-person programming, please visit commonwealthclub.org events. I'm Rachel Myro. Thank you and take care.